Wednesday, the thirteenth of March, twenty twenty-three. Welcome to the show. Today, Public Protector finds no wrongdoing in Palapala. Opposition parties lose their collective minds as they call the ambulance. Strikes in the Boerland as farm workers disperse with stun grenades and rubber bullets as they protest working conditions, living below the breadline. Steve Offmeyer agrees to pay 100,000 rand as he loses his crusade against the Little Mermaid and various other Disney characters. And finally, tragically, closer to home in Bishop's Lavis, community activists and dancers shot and killed while walking home. Rest in peace, Christopher Adams. My name is Roscoe Palm. I'm with super producer Nantel Hopley. Nantel, how was your weekend, brother? No, I'm, uh, it was good. Um, heel rustig, um, chilled. Uh, time spent with family and for some friends. That's good. Some of that time spent uh, in the dark with family and friends. Uh, yep, unfortunately, but we're getting used to it. We are. We're getting used to it, but the point is, we shouldn't be getting exactly, used to it. Exactly. No. Exactly. On that topic of load shedding, that's the that's what we're discussing. Today with my uh, my friend, my colleague, my comrade, my brother, Philip Dexter. He's with me today. How are you doing, bro? How was your weekend? Also, I had periods in the dark. Yeah, but generally it was okay. Yeah, I'm I'm very sorry about the period in the dark that you had to spend after that the Bournemouth game. That was uh, no, no. We still we still still we still the flying. Line. So after the man, after Man United, yeah, that that, that off the glow. Did you see that meme with, with Robin Hood, like you know, with the, our manager with a bow and arrow? It says, "Steals from the rich, Man United to give to the poor." Born with it. Yeah, no, exactly. Those three points, those three points are exchangeable. Uh, but, that's um, okay. We don't need them. That's but fine. We but look, we're here to talk about ESCOM mm. and. Um, you know, you you are a um, a former member of parliament. You 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 served in uh, from 1994 to 1999, and then again you served in uh, 2009 for a little while. So you are well aware of the the ins and outs. So you spent a life in politics and activism and and fighting um, for a better life for all. As an as a member of the ANC, you went into exile. Um, so. Let me just uh, start this immediately by saying that you know that the the grid was not built for majority of, of our 60 million people. So, what was the grid built for, and how did it function pre 1990? So, the, what you're talking about really is the history of ESCOM. So, prior to 1992, uh, 1922, sorry, electricity generation was really local, local governments. Private people would produce electricity. With uh, the passing of the act that created ESCOM in, in 1922 and 1923, ESCOM took over and became a monopoly. The idea was that the state should do this, so it would generate power, distribute it, uh, transmit it, and distribute it. So, what happened is from that period until about 1990, ESCOM became the largest. Uh, electricity, electricity utility in Africa. It produced 95% of South, As South Africa's electricity and about 45% of all the electricity in Africa, mostly consumed by us, but some transmitted to states. It made ESCOM one of the largest electricity utilities in the world, compared to many, many other countries. But you're right to say that the model was not designed to distribute to the majority of consumers. It was really designed to produce electricity for white people in their areas and for industry. 
the fact that electricity went to places like Soweto and others was really a byproduct because Soweto was close enough to the do The electricity so. just happened to be passed through happened to be close, close by, so, you know, we can sell them some. Yeah. Yeah. So there was no plan to electrify the rural areas, the homelands and everything else. Then comes democracy. So the ANC comes to power and says electricity for all. Rightly so. At the same time that the ANC is coming to power, the National Party in the 1980s was closing down plants, mainly old coal-fired plants, so that you have a decline in um, you know, energy capability, um, generation capability, but an increase in demand. The ANC government gets told this, and the demand is and the request is that we need to build more power plants. Because of the economic policy at the time and late, later on the gear policy, the answer is no, there's no money to invest in generation. And this is just a scare story from the former white regime. So we're talking, we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. But um, 1994, uh, we have a democratic dispensation and then the, the better life for all promised to electrify households and, and businesses that were previously mm -hmm. excluded from the grid. So there's this explosion in demand, but the supply is, stays the same. Um, how, how, does, uh, how does government then try to keep up with that demand, or do they? Well, that's the thing. You know, it's one of those things I think historians have to look at, because as you say, you have a policy that says we used to only produce electricity for this. Now our market is three times that. Any business would know that you have to be able to increase the supply. But for whatever reason, for policy reasons, there's no attempt to do that. And despite all the warnings from people that you need more generation capacity. And also, at, even at that point, the call for people to start investing in renewables. Both of these things are ignored. And in fact... You know, it's an interesting thing because the ignoring of renewables was driven by ESCOM. Because if you understand ESCOM, it really is part of what we call the coal industrial complex. ESCOM was created on the basis of cheap coal, dirty coal, to supply cheap electricity. And in the day, in the 1920s, 30s and 40s, that was okay. It was considered to be cool, you know, as long as the energy was clean. Nobody was worried about emissions and the stuff that they do today. But in, in that period of 1990, I'd say, to 2000, all these issues surface. What's interesting is that government doesn't respond to any of them in any kind of serious way. The most they did was talk about the pebble bed reactor, mm. which was this mini nuclear reactor. Mm. But after some time, they canned that project, which today has been touted by all sorts of private equity people as a solution to energy crises. So it's interesting. Go yeah. figure. Yeah. yeah. So then you, you've got the, the government then uh, in 1994, it, it's embarked on the Reconstruction and Development Program, the RDP. Then in 1996, it goes to GEAR, um, the, the uh, Growth, uh, economic. economic and uh, Reconstruction. No. Uh, growth, Economic. And Redistribution. And Redistribution. Yeah. Um, effectively, growth what, employment and growth employment and so effectively, what that means is they start government starts to invest less in infrastructure mm. like the grid, like um, uh, like our capacity, energy generation, any energy generating capacity. Yeah. In 1998 or 1999, a report comes out saying that we urgently need some more uh, generation mm. capacity. What happens then? So they commissioned two big plants, Kusile and Madupi, these mega plants. And on the face of it, that might seem like a good idea because you're going to build these big plants that produce all this capacity. But unfortunately, the rollout and the, the construction of those are beset by huge problems. Everything from corruption to shoddy work to the point that those things have cost three times what they were budgeted for. And at this point, still don't produce the electricity that they're supposed to produce. Yeah. 
So I, I want to sort of, uh, you know, it's, it's all good and well to talk about these things from uh, a bird's eye view. But the, the, the fact is that um, over 50% of South Africans earn about 1,500 rand a month. Uh, sort of that's the, and electricity costs between 1,200 and 1,500 rand a month. Well, not, no, per household that's not true because the one good thing government did do, well, among many things, was to give this provision of free electricity to every household. Mm. So every household in South Africa gets an allocation of a certain amount of electricity, and that's calculated for you to be able to have hot water, you know, your lights on, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the more you use, you know, the more you have to pay. And that's a good principle, that the more electricity you consume, the higher you should pay, the tariff you should pay. But the point is even... So you're doing that, you're saying you'll give this electricity. If you're not generating it, then what are you giving? Mm. So there's a shortfall in what the generation capacity of ESCOM is of anywhere between 4,000 and 6,000 megawatts. And that's why we have what's called load shedding. So the way to understand is the grid is like a swimming pool. It's got a certain amount of water in it. Mm. If the water goes too low, the pool goes into a crisis. If it goes too high, it overflows. So because you've only got a certain amount of water, you can't take too much water out. So you have to balance it. So you say, okay, Roscoe, no electricity for you for two hours. Philip, none for you for two hours, and so on. Mm. And that's what load shedding is doing. And it's a, it's a very clever mechanism to do it, but at huge inconvenience to the consumers. And, you know, the real issue is how do you address that shortfall? Yeah. So then the first load shedding that ever happened, uh, 2000, do you remember where you were? No, I can't remember. Okay, I specifically remember that. I remember, I remember the time where I was uh, in Plumstead, the power just went off. There was no such thing as, it's like, oh, no, it's two hours load shedding. It might come on at like 10 past mm. 6. It was just like in the dark. The lights went you know? out. It's, the lights went out with like no indication as to, as to and that was it's so unusual. Um, and it harked back to this old um, this this old newspaper um, front page that's been going around on Twitter. And Antel, I don't know if you can if you can pull that up. Um, in the there was a um, a newspaper headline. Um, oh, die Transvaler, start kom tot stilstand. Kracht to voor vijf en dertig minuten onderbreek. So the power went out for thirty five minutes. And the, it was a it was a front page front page headlines. Verkeer zwaarste getref. The, the what year is this? I'm not so sure. Um, there is I can't. I tried to zoom in to find the date, but that was obviously. It's very interesting. There's a Danal missile in the next picture there, taking off from the ship. Oh, interesting. Okay, well, we we can talk about Danal <laughs> later on if you want to. But yeah, so yeah. you know, it was so um, unusual to have yeah. the, the, the the power off. It was something that well was unusual to... unusual for people who lived in areas where there's electricity because yeah. the reality is most South Africans had experienced nothing but continual load shedding for many many years until the ANC came to power. Mm. So there were huge parts of the country who never had electricity. And then there were actually parts of the country who were having load shedding all the time. Yeah. So load shedding is not a new concept. Load shedding for white people and people in the urban areas is a new concept. And that's a very interesting political point because this pretense that, oh, everything was hunky-dory, it was perfect, everyone had electricity. Mm -hmm. Nonsense. The vast majority of South Africans were living in a state of darkness for many, many years. Mm -hmm. I think that with democracy comes the sharing of benefits and of all the challenges. What we are experiencing is the fact that ordinary people who've always experienced this are now um, in the position where the elite are experiencing what they did. It doesn't make it right, it's not a good thing, but I think we have to keep things in perspective. I agree with you there, but this is a it is a crisis, of course. You know, Absolutely, and, and it's a in in many ways it's a, it's an all-consuming crisis. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's a, a great leveler, a, a leveler, sure. But there there are many things that are being leveled 
through this crisis yeah, that yeah. should still be be standing. Um, now we have stage three, stage four, stage six. Uh, we don't know where it's like rolling the dice to find out what stage you're going to be on, really. So um, there have been interventions by government to try and address it. But um, now we're at a stage where we have a minister of electricity, uh, a minister of public enterprises, and a... Um, a minister of Minerals and Energy Resources. All three ministries and the presidency are tasked with dealing with, with solving this crisis. How do we navigate those? Um, I would I would call it those bureaucracies to mm. find literal light at the end of the tunnel. Well, you know, I think that people have made a, a mouthful out of this because they all have different roles. If you look, so the president is in charge of the government. And he appoints ministers to deal with particular issues. And there are policies and regulations and laws. So the Minister of Public Enterprises is the shareholder of ESCOM. That's what they do. Mm. Is ESCOM performing? Is it being governed properly? Does the board run the thing properly? The Ministry of Minerals and Energy sets the policy for the country to do with energy in general, which includes everything from the price of paraffin to petrol to, you know, gas that you buy in your home, including the policies that determine what should be the mix of energy that is used to generate electricity. What the president has done, I think, is to try and prioritize somebody to deal with the crisis of the generation capacity. And he's chosen a person who was previously in charge of infrastructure development because presumably that person has a handle on how to raise money, how to put the infrastructure in place, how to build the rollout capacity. Where I do think you're right is that it's very confusing for the public, and probably it creates the possibility for turf wars in government. But I think if the president leads properly, that shouldn't happen. But what they haven't done is explain it very well to the public. You know, they haven't explained it. It's very simple, as I've said three different roles. I mean, what you said is key there about it, the, the public having either a lack of understanding, a mm. misconception, or just a, a resistance to, to yeah. anything like that. And I think in, in, in... If there's one crisis bigger than electricity, it's the failure to communicate by the government. I mean, the communication strategy is just... It's, it doesn't exist. They think making statements... So is a substitute for explaining to people. You don't have politicians giving their time and going to people and explaining why is there load shedding, what's the plan to do, you know, how did this come about? And I think that that's crucial because government's role really, not only to deliver basic services, is to educate the citizens and make them aware of what the situation is. But it seems that that's not part of the plan. Do you think that for many people, we actually, um, th they are irretrievably past the point of believing or trusting the government because th this ESCOM thing, as we said, it's, it's been going on for, for many, many years now through many administrations? Well, yeah, of course, it's not just ESCOM, if you think about it. I mean, you know, we had uh, state capture, all the corruption, ESCOM, many, many things including now the strike in the health services. You mentioned one strike, but we're, sitting, we're here, as we sit here, hospitals are not functioning around the country. So I think there is a general problem of trust in government and government institutions. And that's not the fault of the public. That's the fault of the leadership, because you can't, the public only knows what they know. And what do they know is what you tell them. So I really believe that a crucial, crucial part of this problem is the communication strategy. And that's why I think initiatives like yours with this podcast and that, everybody should be doing something to tell people what's really happening. Okay, well, thank you very much. That was my small advert for you. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. And thanks for yeah. supporting sir. Yeah, no, well, look, we, we're trying, but, you know, as if government can deliver me a, a treadmill that's hooked up to a, a generator that I can generate my own electricity, that will be great. No, Roscoe, you generate enough hot air. You Thank you. Just burn Thank that you very much. That's clean, affordable, clean, affordable. sustainable <laughs> energy. And it's renewable. Exactly. <laughs>
So, um, look, I want to come back and talk about uh, a couple of things. I want to talk about the impact that this will have on um, on the on the upcoming elections. I want to talk about Andre de Reiter. I think we can uh, have a break for twenty seconds, and then we can um, we'll be back with more Philip Dexter. We're back. Nantel, we are on Cape Conscious Media. What's been happening on Cape Conscious Media this week and what do we have coming up? Um, so we have, um, we have Jozone um, on, on Thursday. Just put my mic on. Uh, we have Jozone on Thursday. Um, Wednesday we have a very, very good um, a goodie. We've got um, a podca- your podcast, the second installment, mm. where uh, maybe you can just give us a, a brief on it before I go on. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that one, Philip. You must tune in. I'm speaking about Heathfield High School. And uh, I invited the Western Cape Education Department. They declined to be on. Um, uh, I wanted to ask them why they spend three million rand persecuting Wesley Newman, the principal of Heathfield High School. Uh, Khalid Syed uh, in, from the legislature, he will be coming as well. And then I think we'll be having a learner from Ethel High School to Excellent. tell us about you know what life has been like under this new regime. And then, you know, my favorite show is on, on Saturday, actually. Yes. They, they have these kids. So it's, yeah, Saturday morning, we have uh, the Blast uh, students in. They are amazing. They are like superstars. Eh? We've got... Um, you know, I, I just know Noah. Know, uh, the, the names... Um, I've got their names now, but but they've got two females. That's that's part of the the um, the one is a, 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 a Muslim lady. She's in the job, and they talk about just grown up stuff, man. But and it's just their opinion on on um, uh, GBV and on um, the new pronouns, um, and just we we just get to to hear the future, man. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? And 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 the get, the best thing it's it's not it's not. The, 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 the teacher is in the room, but it's not, it's not like he's telling them what to say. It's mm-hmm. just, he gives them the, the, he preps them as, as to what they're going to talk about. He, uh, he allows them to do some research on it, and, and they just go. Just, just, they just go. Mm. Absolutely brilliant, man. And, and it's something that I've wanted to, to be a part of for so long, just to hear what, what, um, mm. what the youth are saying, man. Because sometimes we as adults, we try to man, not manipulate, but we try to, 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 to steer the conversation a certain way because of our bias. But sometimes we just like 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 um t- uh, what's his name um Kanye West say, says um let's just listen to the kids man <laughs> you know what I'm saying yeah uh, look I'm not worried about AI uh, taking my job I'm worried about those kids taking my job they they sharp and smart as tax bro true true yeah and um yeah so look I, what's I want it, what's this oh that oh this um this is a uh, this is uh, a post. About uh, remember that issue about uh, Andre de Reiter was he was going ah. to flee the country after yeah. he gave that interview. So this is a post I found on Facebook. Uh, de Reiter is fleeing the country for his life, but not before the power breakfast at two hundred and fifty rand per ticket. Now you know I think it's a little bit of shit houseery, you know, like sort no, of. No, no, like, the price is cheap. At the price. It is cheap, eh? but how come they're for white people? Man? Old Helen Zilla, Andre Duvanaga. Do you think? You know, I mean, really? Yeah. No. In this day and age, they, they couldn't find a more representative panel. Uh, uh, People uh, say, don't raise a race issue, but actually, you do have to. Because how can you have an all-white panel talking to a population where white people are like less than 
fifteen percent of the population. And they get they get a nice discount, eh? Two hundred and fifty Rand per person. That's uh you know, that's uh, really I'm not sure what is it's like an heaven at, at Wimpy or something. Be, uh, who's busting bad myths? Oh no, that's the Basting Bad Myths is the page that that. Uh, but who's the hosting post. the dinner? Not sure. Oh, anyway, moving on. Yeah. Same old, same old. Yeah. Speaking of speaking of other speaking of uh, of of white people, I just want to uh, get your opinion on on this on the Steve Hoffmeyer thing. Um, I can't look. Uh, I know we're talking about Escom, but I think this is a lot of people are. Um, Steve Hoffmeyer has never apologized, even though he's an arsehole. Today is apologized because it's a court mandated apology. So during the past 11 months, a lot was said and equality court proceedings followed about the video I posted on my Facebook profile. Um, I criticized the policy decision by Walt Disney for the latter's decision to attribute sexual identities to the movie characters. First of all, Sexual identities are in all movie characters. I'm pretty sure that, like, you know, the Little Mermaid and the Prince, they, you know, they had sexual identities. And actually, those are gender identities. Yeah. Not sexual identities. Anyway, so Steve Hoffman has to pay 100,000 rand of his hard-earned uh, money. I think, I think it's a very lenient fine. Yeah. Because what he has done many times over, he's a very hurtful person. Mm. Uh, he's brutal, actually. So... I'm very glad that he's apologized. I don't believe for a moment that he really feels sorry. He's just doing it because he wants to stay out of jail, mm. where, you know, if he was to serve time, his own gender identity may be something that's questioned. Well, I, I didn't say that. Those are your words. I, I actually uh, I saw a, um, a post today where the guy says, uh, Steve Offermeyer should stick to racism because that's what he's good at. <laughs> leave, leave the <laughs> sexual gender <laughs> stuff. Just stick to what you know, buddy. Yeah. Ah, that's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> Stay, stick in your yeah. wheelhouse. Yeah. So, yeah, look, coming back to the ESCOM thing, which, you know, is mm. very, very serious. Look, what, what, caused, what caused load shedding? How, what are the factors that brought mm. us to where we are today? So we spoke a bit about the failure to invest in infrastructure and building new plants. I think the second thing is that the cost structure and the way in which ESCOM ran its finances was terrible for many, many years. So there were always these sweetheart contracts on coal. You know, the Guptas did it, but they were not the first. The Guptas learned it from the Funda Watwats and whoever before. The third thing is that crime and corruption generally... As we know, you know, Andre de Reiter made the statement about syndicates. We've known for 20 years that syndicates have been operating there, but the law enforcement agencies have done nothing about it. And then the, the last thing was this policy failure. So now we have this just transition from, you know, coal to renewables. That was already written into our policies. So in the future... Gas, solar, wind, hydro would probably make up 40% of our generation by the year 2030. The issue is how do you manage that change? So Western countries came along with this policy, the just transition with this money. The fight is what does that mean for jobs in the coal industry? And I think it's a bit of a, uh, what do they say? Um, you know, when a chimera, because it was a straw man. Because there is no real contradiction. With growing demand, you could keep coal production at what it is and the future would be renewables. But because of, again, the communication problems of management. So there's a basket of issues that led to where we are. I guess the key thing is, how do we change that? So already the government has done things like reduce any restriction on private generation of electricity. I think it's not making it easier for PPPs and so on. And a big issue is the tariff, that what do you pay people who produce electricity? Because if you can't make a profit out of it, why would private investors do it? But I think the big thing is government's investment into the future, because I'm not denying the private sector has a role to play. But ESCOM is a state-owned entity. They need to fix it and they need to reinvest into infrastructure for the future and do what they've promised, which is to separate energy generation from transmission, which is the good, to delivery. And I think importantly is to leave delivery to the local governments. They make money out of it. They do it better than ESCOM can because they know their customers. 
And that's been the system that's worked if you look in successful areas. How would that work practically? So let's say we are living in the city of Cape Town. Um, so ESCOM is uh, just... Uh, the But it can't, that's, the, that's what happens. ESCOM generates the electricity. It also transmits it through the grid. But you get billed by the city of Cape Town. There's some areas where ESCOM mm-hmm. builds directly. So it exists. They're, but they're just large areas of the country where it doesn't. And my point is separate the three out. There's one last thing that we should be looking at, which is what the Minister Mantash spoke about, building a second utility. So his idea was to build that utility here in South Africa. I think, given the history of our region, we should really look at building a second utility in the SADC region so that you have generation by the SADC countries for themselves and to sell back to South Africa so that you begin to have a balance of generation across the region. At the moment, ESCOM exports electricity to all these areas. So what are, we have all of this cheap coal, actually. And as you alluded to, we have uh, the just transition, which is the global north um, and uh, telling us the, how we should, um, tr- that we should transition, that we should actually um, take the hit uh, economically and transition to um, uh, renewables. Look, in principle, I've got no problem with renewables, and I think it's, it's and nuclear because I think it's it's what it has to happen anyway. But um, I'm very uncomfortable when it comes to being dictated to about what we should do with our energy policy, particularly because we have all of this cheap coal which we can use to to develop our own country. How do we manage those? Um, I wouldn't say contradictions, but manage those headwinds between. Um, mm. A sustainable future and also this resource that's abundantly available in South Africa. Well, I think you're right. There are a couple of things going on. The one is, one, being told by other people that we shouldn't emit at the extent to which we do. Globally, if you look, we emit 2% of the emissions as, as South Africa. So we are a tiny emitter. The bulk of the emissions, 60%, comes from Western Europe and the USA. So that's important because what they're doing is they're paying us to limit emissions so that they can continue to admit to emit, and that's wrong. The principle of shifting away from dirty coal to clean coal, renewable, etc., is right, but it's the how you do it. So there is technology to use coal in a clean way. You can transform coal, in, transform coal into gas, into all sorts of things. You can wash it and clean it so that it doesn't have the same emissions. And I think that's what we should be doing as a country. But what we should not be doing is compromising our own energy um, sec- security to benefit other people. And I think that that's the crucial point. When we're talking about energy security and, and energy sovereignty, you know, the, we, we hear a lot about um, uh, that ESCOM is a, is a mess, it should be privatized. That's sort of like the uh, panacea for yeah. like all of our ills. So why is it a bad idea for ESCOM to be privatized? And what does this entail? Well, you know, private, that privatization is a thing that's bandied about by people with a certain ideological agenda. You know, we call them neoliberals. The, the private can do better. I think such statements are as false as saying the, pu- the public sector can do it better. Because it's a case-by-case case thing. Why was ESCOM created? was because if you wanted to create energy security, you had to go from the mom-and-pop shops producing electricity so that you could build an industrial base, which the National Party and prior to that the United Party under Jan Smuts were trying to do. They were trying to modernize South Africa. Of course, as we said, they were doing it for a certain section of the population. But the principle is right. A modern state needs energy security. It doesn't mean there isn't a role for the private sector, so investing in generation. But controlling the grid is an issue of national security. That must be in the hands of the state. And countries where they've not done that, you've seen in the United States of America and Texas and California, the collapse of things because the private sector will be like, well... Sorry, it's not our responsibility. So I think the idea of privatization is something that is the solution to this problem, 
is absolute nonsense and people who peddle it are doing it for ideological reasons. But equally, pretending that the private sector has no role to play is also silly because they have capital mm. and they want to invest. Yeah. Look, uh, uh, there also we spoke about the Pebble Bed Modular Reactor. You know, that's mm. sort of like a technology from the future that we went all the way to the past to, to get and now other people are onto that. What are some of the other technologies mm. that we can um, uh, immediately start to um, take advantage of in South Africa given our resources, our energy profile? What, what, what can we do? Yeah, the Pebble Bed, I think it's German technology that we then developed and has now been sold all around the world by private equity people as a solution to micro problems. And, you know, I know that nuclear is a scary thing, but it is something we have to think about because it does provide clean energy if it's managed properly. The, the interesting thing about South Africa is that we produce, well, we produce, we have a mineral resource called thorium in abundance in our beach sands. It's a, a mineral that can be used to generate electricity through a nuclear process that is basically clean. And the reason why that was never exploited is because the money was always in the big nuclear stuff. The industry, the military industry, wanted the developments to be there. So I think there are interesting solutions that we could look at and explore. You know, but right now the crisis is this four to 6,000 megawatts. The easiest solution, interestingly enough, is gas. And whilst the car power should Thing was overpriced and really, really, you know, out to lunch. The principle of bringing modular gas uh, turbines into place is actually the correct one. They don't have to be on ships. We already have turbines, three of them operating here in Cape Town, one in Atlantis, one in Goodwood, and one at the waterfront. Mm. They're burning diesel, diesel at a huge uh, mm. price. They can actually burn gas at a much cheaper rate. So the question is who's benefiting from the diesel contract when it would be easy to convert them, you know. So let's talk about the <clears throat> the um the coal lobby and the hold that the coal lobby has over mm. the um our, our energy sector. Uh, you you alluded to that that it's yeah. a, a it's a generational um I, I don't want to use the word mafia, but you know what I'm saying. It, it's like a, a a collection of interests um, a monopoly. A monopoly. How does it work in? How does how does the coal lobby affect, say, somebody living in Steenburg, you know, who is sitting in uh, in the dark? You know, how does how does that um, economy work? So you know the way ESCOM developed and the way the mining industry developed in our country, uh, and government, the old National Party government, there was literally a revolving door between the department ESCOM and Anglo-America, who mined the coal, most of the coal. And as I said, cheap coal, easy to mine, sell it to the state, generated the electricity. The virtuous circle, if you like, of providing this cheap electricity. But as time has moved on, you know, for example, ESCOM has been central to blocking renewable energy. And why? Because it's not in the interest of the coal players who have a hold in ESCOM. You know, if we had taken the decision to free up generation through renewable energy 20 years ago. We wouldn't have the crisis we have today. The main stumbling block was actually ESCOM and then the regulations and the policy of government by saying, that, you know, the first window was 1,000 megawatts. Mm. Well, big deal, you know, when you've got 40,000. If they had said 10% at that point and later 20 or whatever, today we would be at the 40%. But the stalling and the blocking by those whose interest is in mining coal. And again, I say, I'm not against the mining of coal and the use of coal. But if you want to say that that to the detriment of the energy security of the people of South Africa, then you're part of the problem. So how do we, how do we, um, is there light at the end of the tunnel? And when, is it, uh, hopefully it's not an approaching train? Uh, when can we see the end to load shedding? Mm. Well, look, I think we urgently need a leadership in ESCOM who can turn that institution around. You know, Andre Dorator 
who I personally think didn't have a good track record even prior to ESCOM. If you look at you know his role at the um, uh, listed company where he was before, he may be a good administrator, but I think what you need is a leader who can turn that institution around. And it's not an impossible task to do. I think secondly, we need to urgently address this issue of what's the quickest way to generate that shortfall. And I personally believe it's gas, because I think we can buy those modular systems and put that in place uh, relatively quickly, whilst we carry on with the normal process of, of you know, creating new power stations, both coal and renewable. Then I think thirdly is we've got to address the surrounding issues, because ESCOM doesn't exist in a vacuum. All the state-owned entities are in a crisis. We all have problems of crime, corruption, mafias. There's mafias in the construction industry and everywhere. There's a greater issue that government has to take care of, which is the environment within which an entity like ESCOM exists. Mm. You can't have a situation where gangsters are dictating to you that you can buy coal Mm. or build a building. And that responsibility sits with government. We have a police force, we have an intelligence service, we've got the hawks, we've got all the tools at our disposal to deal with that. So there should be no excuse from government to say we can't deal. If government can't defeat the mafia, then that means the mafia is in charge. Mm. Simple. No, absolutely. And of course, you speak from experience in the, in the sense that you, you are the chairperson of um, a state-owned enterprise. So you know that ecosystem very well. Yeah. Um, I just, how much did, you know, I, I don't want to hop on Andre the Rater because, the, you know, the, the crisis and the system is bigger than, than one man. Um, but how much responsibility does he in his position bear for, um, for load shedding, for example? Could he have done a, a better job? Um, did he do the best he could do with the tools at his disposal? What's your take on him? Look, I think he has a huge responsibility because he was given that job. If he knew the things that he finally said at this interview of his, the famous interview, where, of course, he also said a lot of things that are untrue. You know, one of these things he said is that this $8.5 million that the ANC is going to steal. The reason he's upset is because that money, which comes from the World Bank, they didn't want to give it directly to... Uh, ESCOM because of all the problems. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to channel it via one of the financial institutes in government, like the DBSA or the IDC. I mean, the money is still coming to the country, but he makes this allegation that the ANC wants to steal that money, saying he made a lot of wild allegations. I think a couple of people have said, one, you should have reported these crimes when you knew. Two, you've now said these things, produced the evidence. Mm -hmm. And Interestingly enough, the ANC has responded by saying, you've alleged that ANC people are, and the ANC is benefiting. Mm-hmm. We're giving you till whatever time it was to produce the evidence. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the right route. Too many people make allegations, say things in public that are easy to say. Ah, oh, Roscoe Palm is corrupt. Well, where's the evidence? You can't just run around crying wolf all the time. And I'm not saying the ANC is not responsible for lots of things. But to make allegations that are unsubstantiated when you're a business leader is absolutely unforgivable. So I think he has a lot to answer for. And the fact that he's departed in the way he has is unfortunate. But I think a lot of the blame rests at his own feet. I've got one more question. Because, look, we're all carrying on. We're having this discussion under the assumption that uh, the ANC um, is the is at the wheel. Um, now, this crisis has caused uh, some commentators, or actually, I, I believe the majority of commentators, to say that, like, well, the ANC are going to dip below fifty percent. Um, do you think that after at the next elections, which is in a little over a year, what do you think the ANC are going to pay a price for load shedding in terms of uh, no longer? Uh, having uh, the power nationally? Well, I'm not sure what the impact will be in terms of the final, you know, 50%. But there's absolutely no doubt that load shedding will affect the vote for the ANC. I mean, it's the most basic thing. It's like 
if you can't deliver water, electricity, you know, um, clean air, of course the voters are going to punish you. So the question is, what will be the percentage of that? And I think it's a very unfortunate situation because it will not create more stability. I think if you, if you've seen it, local government and that coalition governments just bring instability. So I'm not sure that that's the solution. Uh, there is a coalition arrangement I would prefer if that were to be the case, but I don't think that's on the cards unless things go the way I hope they will. But I do believe that there will be a negative impact on the ANC, and that is most unfortunate. And it's something the ANC leadership have to take responsibility for. Well, just in, just in closing, something a little bit more predictable. Um, Liverpool, Champions League or not? <laughs> Yeah, we got to do a producer manu moment and manu moment. When look at we can, we've done it before. Oh. So, no, to qualify for the Champions League, yeah, to, to fourth. I, no, exactly. I'm saying we've done that before. I've, I put my faith in the, the team. Yeah, good man, Philip. Thank you so much thank for coming, you. brother. Thanks, producer. Thanks, man. Cool. That's all we have today. Join me on Wednesday. I'm talking about uh, Youthfield High School, examining the real state of things in that school, close to our hearts, close in our communities. And until then, check out all the content from Cape Conscious Media and have a good night.